Okay, okay first let me thank the speakers. The speakers. Let me thank the organizers for, for a wonderful meeting, for arranging for us to get together and, and, and exchange ideas and for the opportunity to, to tell you about the work we have been doing. Uh, the work I've been going to be talking about uh, involves collaboration with all these uh, people in, in various, with, along several years. Uh, and I'm very fortunate to be speaking uh, in the last day because many of the things that I will talk about have been touched in some way or another during the, during the, sorry, ah, my mom. Um, so the plan of the talk is I'm going to make first some general observations about the quantum measurement problem in gravitational context. Uh, then I'm going to say a few words about uh, our approach to exploring the quantum gravity interface. And as, a, as applications of these ideas, I will uh, talk about the inflationary account of the emergence of seeds of, of, co of cosmic structure. Uh, basically recounting in some degree the, the lecture by uh, Professor Martin, and, uh, but uh, showing, focusing on, on an aspect uh, there that was, uh, that appeared only as a question uh, at, at the last moment. Uh, then I'm going to be uh, sketch for you uh, how this uh, approach allows you to, to diffuse the black hole information the puzzle. And finally, if there is time, I will mention some, some other promising aspects of, of this approach. Uh, okay, so let me first uh, say a word uh, uh, about the foundational aspects that we will be touching on. Uh, normally, in, when people try to deal with the foundations of quantum mechanics, the, first issue that arises, or one of the first issues that arises, is the ontological question. What exists and what, is the the what exists according to the theory? But normally, those uh, uh, questions are posed in terms that assume a classical space-time as given. In fact, if you look at, at most of those proposals, uh, the question is posed, what exists according to the theory in given space-time region? So for instance, the flash ontology in the collapse theory that you have heard about during this, uh, in this, this, this the weeks, uh, flashes are distinguished space-time events associated with the collapse of the wave function. But of, of course, they only will make sense once you have a space-time. Mass density things, well, mass density is the amount of, of matter per unit volume in some space-time region. And for that, of course, you need to know, well, first of all, what is volume and what is a space-time region. But if we were to be treating everything, including quantum, in, including space-time in a quantum mechanical uh, language, we would require, and we cannot take classical space-time as a given, we would require some other type of ontology that is very different and would, would have to be expressed in a very di different language. Of course, the fact is that today we don't really have a fully viable workable, and workable theory of quantum gravity as uh, Professor Padman Avan mentioned there are very various uh, approaches that have uh, that have uh, made some uh, interesting insights, but but nothing that you can that you can really work with and pose any problem uh, and answer it. We don't even know how to describe what it would mean to have a situation in which the universe is in a superposition of various relatively well-defined metrics or space types. Um, then, in, 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 from that point of view, the search for a fundamental ontology would be, at this point, probably premature, and we would need to content ourselves with a, prof uh, a provisional and effective ontology uh, based on, uh, on the idea that we take, we describe 
space-time in, in the classical language. So in that, in that context, in that limited set of contexts, it seems to me that the question of ontology really becomes very simple. What exists in a context of, in which we treat uh, matter quantum mechanically, but uh, space-time classically, must be what gravitates. In other words, it must, you must be able to assign to it something like an energy momentum tensor. That, that is what you should take your theory to grab. But then, of course, when you have, you look at very concrete examples, things become very difficult. Because if, for instance, if you take Bohmian mechanics uh, as, as, as your fundamental uh, theory, uh, the question will arise, well, what, what, what is the, what gravitates, the, the pilot wave or the particle position? And in either case, would that provide a reasonable energy momentum tensor that you can extract from that? Uh, in the case of the flash ontology, well, how do we associate with them an energy momentum tensor that moreover it's conserved? Uh, and of course, if one wants to consider things like the many world interpretation, I would like to know what is the space-time geometry of one of these bifurcating worlds? and whether Einstein equations can be put to hold during this bifurcation. Uh, okay, so the exploration of uh, this quantum gravi uh, uh, gravity quantum theory regime is normally done in a top, uh, in a, in a bottom-up approach. A bottom-up approach is a, in, an approach in which you assume you know what is the fundamental theory, you, start from a hopefully very well formulated mathematical description of that theory. For instance, string theory, loop quantum gravity, causal dynamical, causal sets, dynamical triangulations, things we've heard during this uh, conference. Uh, and then attempt to connect to the regimes of interest, the regimes that are up there in the, in the world at, at some ma macro scale. You try then to apply those ideas to cosmology, black holes, etc. We, uh, the approach we take is complete, is the, is, is, is the complementary approach, which we call it the top uh, bottom approach. Base, the idea is basically take well tested theories, theories that we, for which we have a lot of evidence and a lot of confidence that they contain a lot of truth, if they cannot, even though they can, all, they, they do not, they do not represent the ultimate truth, and push them towards uh, regimes where you could start getting, getting hints of, uh, of what may lie down there. Uh, so the idea is to push general relativity, for which, as I said, we have a very strong, in which we have a strong confidence, together with quantum field theory, uh, well, in, in, in curved space time, uh, to explore re questions and realms that are not normally explored with those. Okay, let me next point that the, quant the, 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 the uh, interface between quantum theory and gravitation need not involve the Planck regime. In fact, <clears throat> as I said, we, it's hard to even start considering what would be the space time associated with a body in a macroscopic superposition. If I put a big sphere in, in a superposition of being here or, or there, the Earth in a superposition of being on one side of the orbit and the other side of the orbit uh, around the sun. We don't know how to describe the space-time, the resulting space-time. In fact, there is an, even an experiment described by, uh, by this paper, uh, Page and Laker, uh, which argues that based on, 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 well, on consideration of precisely that kind of situation, uh, semi-classical gravity is not viable. They, bas they basically use a quantum mechanical device to attempt to put an object in a superposition of being in two places and create different gravitational fields, and then they test for the presence of that gravitational field in an intermediate position. And then they argue that if there are no quantum collapses, if the system really goes to the superposition of being at the two places, then the semi-classical gravity approach produces erroneous results, er results that conflict with experiment. And on the other hand, if there are quantum collapses, then semi-classical GR equations are, are inconsistent because the energy momentum tensor is not conserved during a collapse, while the right-hand side of Einstein equations, these equations that 
were written by Professor Brad Manavan, have the property that this right-hand side automatically has zero divergence, but this right-hand, this, this other side will not have zero divergence during a collapse. So, it, <clears throat> so the approach we will take to this point is to regard semi-classical gravity in a sense following the spirit of, uh, of what was described here as not a fundamental theory, but as a very good approximation in the same way as, uh, uh, as uh, Navier-Stokes equations are a very good approximation to the description, the description of a fluid. We know that these are, are equations that have very nice mathematical properties. We know they have a well-posed uh, formulation, and, and many theorems can be deduced from that. But we know that they do not represent the, the, the fundamental reality, the fundamental underlying reality, and that is accompanied or is a corollary is that they sometimes break down. And they break down, in, for instance, in situations in which uh, a wave in the ocean that may be well described by using Navier-Stokes equations break down when it approaches the beach. There will be places where uh, first cusps, cusps will form according to the theory, and then we know that the, the description breaks down. But after the wave breaks down, Eventually, it, re it returns to a situation in which, again, hydrodynamical situation description is appropriate, and we'll regard, we will regard Einstein's equations, semi-classical Einstein's equations, in precisely that language. So we will imagine that there is a collapse of the wave function. We will incorporate the collapse of, of, of the wave function, which is what we, we want to do. But, of course, since during the collapse, the equations cannot hold, we will say, well, they don't hold. But they hold before the collapse, they hold after the collapse. During the collapse, we need some matching conditions, some way to control this, uh, this uh, breakdown of the, of the theory. But otherwise, we will uh, trust. OK, so how do we incorporate collapse into the GR? Basically, we stick to something that is uh, very, in some sense, very conservative, which is a strict adherence to semi-classical gravity, meaning that uh, uh, what we call a self-consistent configuration is, uh, is, is, a situation, is a situation provided by a metric of space-time, a construction of quantum field theory on a Hilbert sp on, uh, on that space-time and on, uh, represented in, a, in an appropriate field, uh, Hilbert space, and a state in that Hilbert space such that this equation holds. Okay, so this equation, uh, even though it looks relatively linear, for, at least for, for on the size of the fields, is highly nonlinear because, as you see, the whole construction of the quantum field depends on the space-time. But the space-time will have to satisfy an equation, Einstein's equations, with a source, a source that depends itself on not only on the quantum field theory construction, but on the state, the particular state of your matter field. So this is a kind of a generalized version of the Schrodinger-Newton uh, system from which we heard from Professor Biosi the, the, the other day. Uh, a collapse of the wave function would involve a transition from one such situation to another such, such situation. So it, a collapse of the wave function is not simply a jump of the quantum state to another quantum state in the Hilbert space, but a jump, a collective jump from one of these descriptions to another of this, these descriptions. So we can imagine that we are describing space-time in two regimes. We have a regime where semi-classical equations are valid. We will call it the SS, sorry, an initial regime where semi-classical equations are valid. We call it SSC1, self-consistent sem uh, configuration, semi-classical self-consistent configuration one, the semi-classical self-consistent configuration two, and this could, you could imagine the, the uh, corresponding to the wave before the situation of the wave in the ocean before it breaks up, the wave broke. This is the situation after it broke, and then joining them together. In first of all, in an approximation in which the join the the, the juncture is occurs at, at an instant as a first approximate. Okay, this scheme, this this formal scheme, is highly non-trivial to work with, but we have used it to test some of the ideas. Uh, <clears throat> okay, oh, sorry. 
Okay, how could this fit within current views regarding quantum gravity? Well, we know that, uh, that in quantum, recovering from quantum gravity, the standard notions of space-time is a non-trivial uh, process. Among, among the problems faced in that, pro in that program is, for instance, in canonical theories of quantum gravity, one immediately faces the problem uh, of time. Canonical theories produce timeless theories. Uh, and, and more generally, in, even in a uh, relatively well-developed theory, we don't exactly know how to recover uh, you know, space-time from, from such, such approach. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so, so those, among other things, show that these this, uh, extra problems uh, that will appear looking for, for some fundamental ontology. Uh, the solutions... Uh, uh, the solutions go through uh, finding some physical clock, for instance, and considering relative probabilities uh, uh, and wave functions that are, that are relative wave functions. And following that line of approach, one recovers, one appears to reco uh, recover uh, uh, Schrodinger's equations with some corrections that violate unitarity. So this is a, this is a uh, interesting point. Suggestive. Uh, moreover, there are many indications and many suggestions that uh, space-time, classical space-time, may, may be uh, really emergent, as we heard uh, in the previous lecture. And then it is not clear that, as such, the metric tensor should be quantized. If, if one thinks about the Navier-Stokes equation, when one doesn't know exactly what the answer is, but if, for instance, if you will look at the, at the heat equation, it's clearly that we should not quantize. It would, I don't think it would make sense to quantize the heat equation. Okay, so let me now go to the concrete applications. So, as we heard, uh, current cosmology, present-day cosmology, takes inflation as one of its more attractive components. This is the history of, of the universe. This is the moment in which the uh, atoms and radiation uh, decoupled, and which represents the, the, the farthest point in the past that we can look at, at least using electromagnetic signaling. Uh, and way before that, we had these uh, quantum fluctuations uh, from inflation. We had the inflationary epoch and, and, and the quantum fluctuations, which are supposed to uh, see the uh, small inhomogeneities we see here in the, in, in the CMB, which later grow to form all the structure in the universe. Uh, and in fact, that is considered, the, the, the inflationary account for that is considered as one of the most impressive predictions of inflation. Well, what, what are the data that we, we, we are so happy with? The data are basically uh, obtained by taking a map of the sky this is the ma a map of the sky in, uh, in, in CMB, in, in, uh, in, mi in microwave uh, wavelength. And uh, the dark spots represent the colder uh, points that are slightly cold, colder than, than the average. The, bright, the, the yellow red spots represent points that are slightly hotter than the average. And this map, this temperature map on the sky uh, is then uh, expanded Basically, we have a map of a two sphere. We have a function on a two sphere that can be expanded in spherical harmonics. And the coefficients uh, are called the alpha LMs, and, and, and they can be extracted directly from, from a convolution of this, uh, of this quantity with the spherical harmonics integrating over the, over, over the sky. And these objects are then combined in this particular form. Basically, it's the average over orientations of the alpha LM squares and we obtain a quantity called the CL, which is the quantity that cosmologists, uh, observational cosmologists, like to plot theory against data. And we see that the data and the theory fit exquisitely yeah. well. Uh, and of course, this is a, a very, very big success. Uh, but let's now recount a little bit. Let's go back to the to the account of how we predict these things. The, the, the starting point of the analysis uh, is a, a flat Robertson-Walker spacetime, 
uh, which is inflating, has a scale factor that is uh, undergoing exponential inflation, uh, expansion due to the, press, the, infla, the, the presence or the effects of an inflaton background field, which in the semi-classical language that I would prefer to use is basically is nothing else than the expectation value of the zero mode part of the field. Uh, and that, uh, uh, that quantity has a non-zero value. It's actually is represented by a sharply peaked state of the zero mode. And then the scale factor behaves approximately uh, exponentially, which in this uh, conformal coordinate, uh, conformal time coordinate look, takes this particular way. On top of this background, one considers perturbations. One considers uh, perturbations both in the scalar field uh, and the metric variables. And one assumes this uh, to be characterized. We describe these perturbations quantum mechanically. One assumes that they are characterized by the vacuum state particular state that's called the bunch davis vacuum. Uh, let me point for the students uh, that uh, you know, a quantum field looks like a very scary thing, but you can regard a quantum field basically as a collection, an infinite collection of harmonic oscillators, one for each Fourier mode of the field. So we, we separate the mode as the, the field in, in, in Fourier modes, and each one of the modes of the field has the dynamics of a, basically a, a harmonic oscillator, which as Professor Jerome showed the other day, is a particular type of uh, harmonic oscillator in, this, in, in, cost, in the inflationary scheme that has a frequency that depends with time, and that's report, supposed to be responsible for, for interesting properties. However, in this vacuum state, the field variables have fluctuations. Actually, I would prefer to use the word uncertainties. That's the, each one of these modes is in the vacuum state, is in the ground state of the uh, harmonic oscillator. The ground state is represented by a Gaussian uh, wave function. And this Gaussian wave function, of course, has a width. And those width is supposed to represent the uncertainties in the, in the, uh, in the variable corresponding to the position of that harmonic oscillator. And it is then argued that from those uncertainties, from those quantum fluctuations, the primordial homogeneities and anisotropies emerge. And those primordial homogeneities then grow and become everything, all the structure we see in the universe. But how is this possible? That state, together, including all these, all these uh, fluctuations, is completely homogeneous and isotropic. In particular, one can very easily see that it's homogeneous. One can act on the vacuum state, apply a displacement operator, and you recover the state. So whatever is happening at this point, according to the theory, is exactly the same as happening at this point. How, do this, how does this symmetry break? How do we end up in a situation in which we have a galaxy here and no galaxy over there? The dynamics is not supposed to break the symmetry. You look at what is the dynamics of, of inflation, there is nothing there to, to account for the breakdown of the symmetry. Of course, people say, eh, this is quantum mechanics, and in quantum mechanics, you may have a wave function that is symmetric, but then you observe the system and look, you find the system on this side of the potential. But that is supposed to be the result of somebody coming and doing a measurement. Is your interaction with your quantum system from the outside producing a measurement, producing a change in the quantum state, and that change could result in the breakdown of the symmetry. But of course, this in cosmology doesn't make sense because there is nobody to be measuring, to be making a measurement in the early universe. Okay? So we need to account for this for this problem, uh, and our approach is to look for a physical process occurring in time that explains how these seeds emerge. Uh, and emergence, of course, mean, means that there's something that was not there at a previous time, it's there at a later time. And that's why we need uh, some process occurring in time if we really want to have explain. Collapse theories can do this. And we, we've heard a lot about this dynamical collapse theories. There's a lot of uh, uh, work. Uh, 
And they, our idea is to add this uh, collapse uh, scheme to, uh, to the inflationary uh, paradigm. Considering the collapse of the wave function, as these theories do, as a self-induced uh, process. Uh, of course, for, to do that, one would have to, to, to adapt GR to the context of, of these collapse theories, and we think the way to do it is through this self-consistent semi-classical formalism I described for you previously. So let's look very quickly at the, how you do this problem at the pri in, in, in practice. Well, uh, we have shown that this is equivalent we have, that this is equivalent to the formal scheme, but let's do it in a in a more quickly in a faster scheme. So again, we take a background which is the uh, uh, Friedman Robertson universe with now described classically a homogeneous scalar field, which is the standard procedure one works in with in the inflationary scheme, and considers and we consider perturbations of the metric and of the scalar field. But our approach calls for quantizing the scalar field and not the metric perturbation. Right? What well, I said. We should describe space-time in the classical language, but matter in the quantum mechanical language. The space-time treated classically using a fixing a gauge in a particular uh, form uh, can be said to have this form. We have basically two types of uh, perturbations. The, 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 the most important, uh, the ones that we have observed, the scalar perturbations, and then there are tensor perturbations there are possible per tensor perturbations also present in the model. Uh, the <clears throat> well, the, 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 the scale factor behaves as I, as I said, and we start our analysis at the time tau, well, minus tau, this, this parameter eta is always negative. We start at a, a, a large negative value, uh, a remote past, and we will use semi-classical semi-classical treatment uh, of gravity. Um, at the early stages, the state of the field is the bunch davis vacuum, is completely homogeneous and isotropic, and the, sp the space-time is therefore completely homogeneous and isotropic as well, as can be seen from looking at Einstein's uh, equation. The vacuum state of the quantum field, however, uh, is such that the operators, this uh, mode operators of the quantum field are characterized, as I said, by, by, by Gaussian wave functions centered at zero with certain uncertainties, but the collapse of the, wave of the wave function will modify the state of the quantum field to a point in which these objects will acquire non-zero expectation values. These quantities in the vacuum state have zero expectation values. We will assume the collapse occurs mode by mode and is described by one of Collapse the one, one collapse theory adapted to the uh, uh, specific situation. Our universe, let me say, will correspond to one specific realization of the stochastic functions that appear in the collapse theory. Well, let's look at how this looks in, 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 in a particular case. Let's look at the uh, at the um, scalar perturbations, the K mode of the of the scalar perturbations. Einstein's equations take this form, connecting the, the perturbation of the metric with the expectation value of the uh, right-hand side of the energy momentum tensor, of the perturbed energy momentum tensor of the theory. And as you see, here we have the expectation value of the momentum conjugate to, or, or, to the, associated with the mode K. And that quantity is exactly zero in the bunch davis vacuum. And therefore, this quantity will be zero, the Newtonian potential will be zero, and your space-time will be completely homogeneous and isotropic. The quantity, of course, of observational interest is, is this temperature variation on the sky. And the temperature variation on the sky can be uh, associated with the variation, uh, with the value of the Newtonian potential at the point in the sky that emitted the photons that we are uh, looking. And that quantity using this equation can be recovered in this, uh, in this fashion. So if I knew what was this expectation value, 
I would be able to tell you what was what is the what is the temperature the temperature fluctuation on that particular point in the sky. Uh, given that quantity, I can recover the quantity, these alpha LMs, the quantities that are, are, are of observational interest, basically integrating this quantity, multiplying it by the spherical harmonic. And here I have a formula that does not appear in any of the other alternative approaches to the problem. It's a formula telling you what exactly is the value of the alpha LM of this characterization of the spectrum of the, of the thermal fluctuations in the sky in terms of the quantities that represent the physics at early, earlier times. No, analogy, no analogous expression uh, appears because unless you are assuming a collapse, the result would be very embarrassing. It would be this quantity computed in the vacuum state, and this quantity computed in the vacuum state is zero. OK. The point, however, is that I cannot, I cannot tell you what this quantity is because I don't know where the collapse occurred. And I don't know what the collapse occurred because the collapse is controlled by these stochastic functions. I, however, can uh, look at this equation and see that it has a contribution from many of these stochastic, from many of these modes. And for each mode, you have a stochastic number. And <laughs> your result is an addition of many stochastic numbers. So you have basically a random walk. And for a random walk, although you cannot predict the total result, you can predict what is the most likely value of the result. And that we do here, and you have an expression for the most likely value of the result. And I already know what this quantity needs to be. This quantity needs to be proportional to k. This expectation, this average of our realizations has to be, become proportional to k. Oh, God. Uh, if the observations are to fit, the predictions are up to fit the, the observations. Uh, <clears throat> now, we have, we have done this, apply basically CSL theory to this, to this uh, modes. So our, we are collapsing mode by mode uh, using this, the, the CSL dynamical evolution equation. And we find that you can, can obtain the correct behavior only if you collapse according to the following recipe. You collapse assuming that each one, each mode has collapses with a different collapse rate which is proportional to k. Or, in other words, you could say that the collapse operators, you can fix, uh, you can leave the, 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 the value of the, of the collapse uh, parameter constant, but assume that the collapse occurs in one of these two operators. Why is this the right thing? We don't know. But what this is showing us is that we get a new cosmology to give us guidance of what are the viable collapse theories that can produce the, observe, the, the correct observational results. Moreover, it's very interesting that if one puts standard values for inflationary parameters, the value one can obtain what is the value of this collapse parameter, and the value one obtains is 10 to the minus 19 seconds to the minus 1, which is not very far to 10 to the minus 17 seconds to the minus 1, which is the standard value of CSL theory. OK. Very quickly, one can do something similar for tensor modes. Tensor modes, however, in this approach, are excited at second order in perturbation theory because the tensor modes don't collapse by themselves. What collapses is the matter, is the state of the matter field. And, and the matter that can source the tensor modes appears only at second order in perturbation theory. Following exactly the same thing, one can compute what is now the the expected spectrum for those tensor modes. And the number that one obtains is very different from the prediction for the scalar modes. It's very different in that things appear quadratic in the inflationary potential rather than, than uh, linearly in the inflationary potential. So this quantity is extreme, is supre suppressed by a very, very large factor. And therefore, we don't expect, according to this approach to see the tensor modes. The prediction from this approach is that tensor modes will not be seen unless you are able to increase your sensitivity by four or five orders of magnitude. And of course, 
We know that tensor modes have not been seen so far. Okay, let me, oof. I'm going to go over a little bit. Okay, so let, let me now go to the second application, which is black hole. We know that <clears throat> stationary black holes are uh, completely described by, by just three parameters, mass, charge, and angular momentum. So it doesn't matter how the black hole was formed. Uh, and uh, of course, you can say, well, all the, the description of how the black hole was formed included the amount of the number of television sets, uh, chairs, spreads, uh, mountains that I threw into it. It's a very large amount of information. The black hole at the end is described by three parameters. A lot of information has been lost. But, but that's not really the case. It, the information is not lost. It's just hidden behind the, the horizon, and there is no surprise. If there was, a, if the black hole was eternal, there would be no issue. There would be no information lost. However, as uh, Hawking showed in the 70s, quantum uh, field theory effects causes a black hole to radiate. It should lose mass, and unless something strange happens, it will eventually uh, evaporate completely and disappear. We will, I will ignore for the moment the, the, the possibility that a small remnant uh, could, be, could be had. Uh, and, uh, and this creates a problem. This creates a problem uh, because normally, at least in the, in, 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 among the community working in fundamental questions, quantum gravity, quantum field theory, and so on, uh, one takes quantum theory to be a unitary uh, theory, and it, preservation of unitarity seems almost impossible in this uh, context. Right? The idea is that you started, you could have started with an initial state to form, initial state that was pure, a quantum mechanical state that was pure, that formed the black hole, and then at the end you have a Hawking radiation which is thermal, and that seems to be a problem. Of course, uh, we should be aware that the problem only appears if we believe that quantum gravity cures the singularity. If quantum gravity does not cure the singularity, then this graph of space-time show us, shows us clearly that even though you may have an initial Cauchy hypersurface, your description of your state in terms of the thermal radiation here is not really a complete description because this is not a Cauchy hypersurface. In other words, there is stuff that is here that is, has absolutely no reason for to be However, if we believe that quantum theory solves the singularity, resolves the singularity, and there is, and removes the need to consider an extra boundary of space-time, the diagram one would obtain is something of that form. And then the puzzle occurs. Because in initial hypersurface, you have a pure state, and finally you have a thermal, a thermal state. <clears throat> but when you give this, a talk like this to people that are not in, in our community, the first thing they will say is, look, what are you talking about? Quantum mechanics is not unitary. Quantum mechanics is only unitary when you don't observe. When you observe, the unitary evolution breaks down, and quantum mechanics is not unitary. Of course, in the black hole situation, we do not consider, consider that this uh, uh, observing observer playing a, a particular role and, and, and well of course this brings us to the, to the quantum measurement problem uh, and as I said in, in, in black holes we don't believe that there is a, a role played by, by an observer or by a measuring apparatus however the theories that solve that try to address the measurement problem uh, via spontaneous collapse have a collapse occurring even if there is no observer so there is a violation of unitarity in these theories independently of whether there is, there is an own observer. And what we want to see is what would a picture look like in which the two types of the departures from unitarity are really one and the same. Uh, okay, let me just say a, a, a word here. You, 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 I, I imagine you, you've heard about this, uh, uh, 
distinction between mixed, uh, improper and improper mixtures. A proper mixture is a state represented by a density matrix that is thought to represent an ensemble of identical systems, each one of them in a possibly different state. And an improper mixture is a density matrix, a similar density matrix that is taken to describe a subsystem of a larger system, the larger system being in a pure state after we trace over the degrees of the system that we consider uninteresting or as part of the environment. So a proper thermal, a thermal state would be the thermal state that we use, for instance, to represent a gas in, the, in, 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 in a room uh, that is, rep is being represented by an ensemble. An improper thermal state would be a state that appears, for instance, when we take the Minkowski vacuum and look at it in Rindler coordinates and trace over the uh, things that cannot be seen by the accelerated observers. Uh, that is an improper mixed state. In this approach, resolving the black hole information paradox requires explaining how a pure state, that's the pure state here in the remote past, becomes at late times a proper thermal mixture, a proper thermal state, not an improper thermal state, because here there is nothing, there is no degrees of freedom to be traced over that could explain or, or could account for your state not being pure. Okay, so that's what we need to do. Okay, so. We consider uh, the standard uh, kind of situation. We describe the matter field by, by uh, uh, color field. The initial state here in the past can be thought to be represented by basically the vacuum of the, of the, quant the vacuum state of the quantum field, except for uh, some excitation of matter that is going to form the black hole. The matter and the ghost gravitational collapse forms a black hole. Uh, And of course, we know that if we want to describe the state of the field here at late times, it's very convenient to uh, use, uh, to make a description that uh, uses, not F, but so, the, the, the degrees of freedom inside and outside the black hole. So this same state can be represented, well, the vacuum state at late times can be represented in this, uh, in this fashion, some, some uh, highly entangled state between this, the degrees of freedom that lie in the exterior of the black hole and some degrees of freedom that lie in the interior of the black hole. This, uh, uh, this quantization, this scheme, this, there are all possible excitations of the degrees of freedom here and uh, all possible occupation numbers of the, of the particles here and all possible entangled with all possible occupations of the corresponding degrees of freedom in the interior. Uh, and this is the state that if I trace over, the, if I compute the, de the density matrix and trace over the interior of the degrees of freedom, would give me the standard uh, uh, thermal state radi radiation corresponding to the Hawking plot. The complete initial state, that, therefore, here can be written in a schematic form in this way, uh, in the language, in the language corresponding to the quantization at late times. We have, we have the vacuum state and with the extra excitation of matter field. And we will consider then the evolution of the, of, the, of the state of the quantum field here until, I want to consider until, until this time. First of all, I will evolve until this hypersurface that comes very close to touching the singularity using one of these modified theories involving spontane spontaneous collapse. For instance, a CSL theory. Uh, to use a CSL theory, we need an evolution in time. To have an evolution in time, we will need to choose a foliation. We will use a foliation in which the uh, vial curvature is constant in the inside and is arbitrary in the outside. And, the, and uh, that foliation will give me then a time parameter to evolve the state from one point to the other. We have done this explicitly in this uh, simple uh, CGHS model where all calculations can be done. And we will apply then to this thing the collapse, the standard CSL collapse dynamics, which, as you know, involves these stochastic uh, uh, terms and collapse operators. I need to make a choice now of what collapse operators. 
or simplicity, I will work in, in, in a scheme in which the collapse operators correspond to the number of operators in the interior of the black hole. Uh, I will wo we work in the interaction picture in the sense that I'm going to consider the CSL terms as interaction and while the standard free Hamiltonian uh, will be treated in the Heisenberg picture, so it goes to the evolution of the fields rather than the state. And the new element that we will introduce is we'll assume that the CSL uh, collapse parameter, instead of it being a constant, is, the, is a quantity that depends on curvature. In particular, that it increases with curvature uh, arbitrarily uh, fast in such a way that when I start approaching the singularity or the quantum gravity region, the collapse becomes extremely, extremely efficient to the point that it achieves in a finite time, it takes me to evolve to the singularity, what CSL normally accomplishes in an infinite time. That is, it will collapse the state here to one of the eigenstates of the collapse operators that we have chosen. So in that case, it's very easy to see that, the, that what will happen to, the, to my initial state, the state that I wrote before, after the evolution, so I have the state in this hypersurface, this is the initial hypersurface. I've evolved, I've evolved it to this hypersurface, and on this hypersurface, the state is this. It has collapsed to one of these eigenstates of the interior number of the, the number of interior excitations. There is no summation here. It's a pure state, but we don't know which one because we don't know what, are, what is the realization of the stochastic wave functions that control the CSL evolution. The next ingredient is a role for quantum gravity. We will assume that quantum gravity resolves, resolves the singularity and that it does not produce very large violations of energy momentum tensor, and that will allow me to tell you what the state is at this hypersurface very, at very late times after the black hole has completely disappeared. Well, what does it do? If, if quantum gravity does what I, I said, it will resolve the singularity since all the energy, basically all the energy that was present in, the, in this initial super hypersurface is present now in this exterior region. The interior region cannot do anything else but become transform this matter plus the, plus the interior state into something that has almost no, no energy. That is, we call it the post-singularity vacuum for simplicity. So it represents a state of zero energy momentum, and that will correspond to a trivial region of space-time. So the space-time here becomes, becomes trivial. And now if I go to an ensemble characterization, in other words, I prepare an ensemble of identical systems in the, in the same state and evolve that initial state according to CSL and do everything that I have said, what I obtain is simply a post-singularity vacuum, the vacuum state in this area, and Hawking radiation in this, uh, in this uh, uh, region of Scry plus. That is, we have a pure state evolving into this mixed state, of course, at the, car car uh, at the level of description of an ensemble. And information was lost, and there is absolutely nothing paradoxical. So that, we claim, diffuses any black hole information paradox. Moreover, once you accept that once you accept that black hole information that black hole evaporation is associated with information loss, you could imagine looking your preferred picture of what you think is occurring at the fundamental at more fundamental scales where we think space-time may have excitations of all kinds of degrees of freedom. Some of these degrees of freedom may be characterized as virtual black holes appearing uh, and disappearing in this space-time form. And associated with all of those black holes, there will be information loss. Therefore, if, even though here the situation that you, are, that you have is basically a flat space-time description. So this suggests that information would be lost. If you accept that information is lost in the black hole evaporation of, in the evaporation of a black hole, that information would be lost in any or in any circumstance. And perhaps that is precisely what is behind 
the collapse theories that we formulated at the phenomenological level. So, okay, since I ran out of time long ago, uh, let me know, not say, not go over the various concerns that one may have. We have, we believe, addressed most of these concerns, not all, not all of them. Uh, there are some open issues that we still need to, to treat. Uh, and more interestingly, there are other applications that I have not uh, accounted for. Apparently, we can, uh, uh, there is a natural way in which this scheme accounts for low power in the CMB at large angles. Uh, there is a, we have a proposal to explain, another proposal to explain dark energy or cosmological constant in terms of the violation of energy, mo energy momentum conservation associated with minuscule violations of energy momentum associated with collapse of the, of the wave function, these many issues. Uh, we think it, this, this putting collapse theories together with quantum gravity may help in alleviate the problem of time. And moreover, there, we have made a proposal for a possible explanation of uh, Penrose files, conjecture, uh, wise curvature hypothesis for the initial state of the universe. There are, we think, we think this is a, a, a very nice situation. And uh, let me finish by saying that although this approach may be wrong, it's so definite and so clearly defined that uh, it can be, in principle, Negated. It can be, in principle, shown to be wrong, and I think this is a this is a, a, a very convenient situation because, uh, as Sir Francis, Sir Francis Bacon said, considering in general the scientific enterprise, truth emerges more readily from error than from confusion. So, having setting setting up for yourself a very clear and well defined uh, view of what you are doing may lead you to either show that, convince you that what you're doing has promise, or may show you that what you're doing uh, is wrong. So I think that ignoring the measurement problem in, application to, in applications of quantum theory to problems last, like the ones I have been discussing uh, could be a se serious source of confusion. Uh, and, and I think, therefore, it's worthwhile taking the problem seriously when addressing those issues. Let me finish there. So, thank you. Thank you for the lecture. And we might well be destroying the information about coffee outside. So we will take only a short question, if any. If not.